Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. And I'm Alice Vale. Although boycott is hardly a recent form of protest, many people are unaware of protests like that going on around them. In this edition of Real to Real, we'll examine a current controversial boycott. And while we still have many happy memories of the Holy Father's visit to the United States, now we're going to meet Joe Hayes, an Iowa farmer who played an instrumental role in bringing the Holy Father to the plains of the Midwest. Our short segments feature a memorable look back at Philadelphia's own visit by Pope John Paul II. When most of us visit our local supermarkets, we walk up and down the aisle and we select one brand of products without really giving it too much thought. We'll pick a brand of coffee because it's on sale or because it tastes better to us. Take this can of Nestle's Quick. To most of us, it's a chocolate flavoring that we add to our milk. What most people don't know is that the Nestle's Corporation has been the subject of a boycott since 1977. In this story, we'll examine the issue of the Nestle boycott. We'll find out who's behind it, why it's happening, and what the Nestle Corporation has to say in response. All of the questions regarding the boycott aside, let's establish one important fact. The sale of infant formula in third world countries is a very profitable business. The International Council of Infant Food Industries estimates the size of last year's market at between $1.2 and $1.5 billion. Other reports put the figure closer to $4 billion. Although there are other manufacturers marketing formula in the third world, Nestle controls anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the market, so it is clear to see that Nestle is more than just chocolate. Living conditions in many areas of the third world are unimaginable to most of us. There is no such thing as water purification and living in dirt is a way of life as modern sanitation is unheard of. Supporters of the boycott contend that Nestle is unethically marketing infant formula in these areas and that mothers are improperly diluting the formula with contaminated water. This leads to severe diarrhea in the infants along with dehydration, malnutrition and often death. Add to this the allegation that through its advertising, Nestle discourages breastfeeding, and you have what many people conceive as a big problem. In 1977, a group convened in Minneapolis, Minnesota to discuss the problem. It was at this time that, in fact, the Infant Formula Action Coalition was formed. Maria Odelia Ramo, past board member of Infact and currently administrative assistant of the Faith and Justice Institute at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, was present at the meeting. Well, we were trying to think of ways that we as consumers could respond to the problem of infant formula. Previous to this meeting, um, health practitioners had written articles in magazines and had petitioned formula corporations to stop their marketing of infant formula. Um, sisters groups, especially Sisters of the Precious Blood, had put in shareholders resolutions against American corporations who were marketing formula, Bristol-Meyer, Abbott's, American Home Products. Nestle's, which has over 50 percent of the market, is a Swiss-based country so we couldn't use shareholder resolutions. So the only way that we could pressure them to stop their marketing of infant formula since letters and other um, types of pressure didn't work was to economically pressure them and so a boycott was called at that meeting. So in 1977, the boycott of Nestle was underway. The boycott is aimed not only at the Nestle Corporation itself but also at its subsidiaries. Although most people are familiar with recent boycotts aimed at lettuce and grapes in the 70s and currently the moral majority's proposed boycott against sponsors of certain television programs, they are reluctant to actually participate in boycotts. Sister Francesca Holly, co-director of the Center for Christian Concerns at Georgian Court College, Lakewood, New Jersey, offers a reason why. I think a lot of people will say, why should I boycott? It won't do any good. My little corner of the world will never affect anybody else. And there are other people who say, 
a boycott is no good because you're really causing division. By you're not buying a particular product, you're causing someone who has never uh, done anything wrong to lose their job. You're causing more unemployment and you're causing bitterness and company rivalry and so on. But I think that uh, in the long run, you have to ask yourself the questions, how many people will benefit by what I'm doing. In an attempt to determine local customers' knowledge of the Nestle boycott, we visited a supermarket in the Delaware Valley and spoke with some shoppers. No, I'm not. No, right on there, yeah, right on. Yes, I have. I have known about it for quite a while. We gave the shoppers a brief summary of the reasons for the boycott and asked them if, based on this information, they would endorse the boycott. I would, yes. It don't bother me a bit. When we want something, we're going to get it, regardless of what. Well, yes, definitely. Even though the controversy surrounding the infant formula issue is not on the minds of every American consumer, it is on the minds of the World Health Organization. In May of this year, delegates met in Geneva to consider an international code of conduct to restrict the marketing and advertising of infant formula. When a vote had been taken on the code, of the 119 voting countries, one voted against the code, the United States. Senator Ted Kennedy held an unofficial hearing on the vote, which he denounced as shameful, and sent his own statement to President Reagan. In order to present a balanced look at the boycott issue, we contacted the Nestle Corporation and invited them to participate in our story. They were grateful for the invitation and the opportunity to present their point of view. Representing Nestle is Dr. Thad Jackson, Vice President of the Nestle's Corporation Coordination Center for Nutrition in Washington, D.C. We do have a minimum requirement in every nation, regardless of whether they have a code or, or they do not have a code. And that is, number one, we do not have mass advertising. We have not had mass advertising in radio, television, newspapers, any of those places since June of 1978, and in very few places really since 1972. We do not sample directly to mothers. We do not have direct con contact with mothers. We do sample to health organizations, uh, hospitals, uh, maternity clinics, and things of that nature, which are in the scope of the, of the uh, health system within a given country. They still are allowed to sell their products in other countries. And they, in fact, have said uh, frequently that they are abiding by the laws that have been set up by this uh, World Health Organization. So it's really a question of which is right and which is wrong. Our promotional activity, if you want to call it to that, is, is directed to the doctor and to um, medical health professionals so that the mother comes in contact with infant formula through the me medical profession and not directly. Corporations hired health practitioners to promote their products by giving free samples to doctors and also by having women, native women, put on white uniforms and go to mothers who are living in their villages giving them free samples and recommending them to use the formula. In four countries, we have some 30, 35 so-called milk nurses that we've been accused of having. Those nurses are there at the request of, that, of those governments. And those nurses do not have contact with the mother except on written requests from, from the health authorities. And their function is to uh, train the mothers in basic primary health care. And in those cases where they have elected or the doctors have decided that the infant should be using infant formula, either as a supplement or in, in certain cases where it's had to supplement breast milk, then the, the milk nurse does go in and show the mother appropriate and proper way of preparing infant formula. In third world countries, babies often go from the baby bottle to the intravenous feeding bottle due to malnutrition. Ron Delovu, a native of Zimbabwe, I remarks. One of the main problems we have there is a malnutrition problem, you know. So um, maybe instant formula could come in there too as part of the problem. The child is in a contaminated environment and no matter what that child takes as food, it's going to be contaminated with the exception of breast milk. And they're living on the floor, even if it's, that child is fully breastfed, it, it still has diarrheal problems, it still has respiratory diseases. And so the important thing here is that it's true, the, the water going into that child will be contaminated, but it will be contaminated whether it's in, in infant formula or whether it's in a local gruel that is, that is being produced there in the village. We're going to go on and get on with the, with the process of trying to develop 
uh, better techniques for the third world, develop indigenous foods, and the other things that are necessary to bring up the health and the welfare of mothers and children. I think we as Christians have a moral responsibility to know what's going on. I don't want to speak for another Christian. I feel the moral responsibility to boycott this particular company at this time. I would think that any Christian who knows um, what is going on would have to make his or her own decision. But I think the important thing is to be aware of the facts. It is not our intention to take a specific stand on the issue of the Nestle's boycott. That's an individual decision, but one that can only be made fairly after both sides of the story have been presented. We feel that we've done this. Now it's up to you. If you'd like more information, please contact us. Thank you. We visited churches in Jefferson City, Missouri and Patterson, New Jersey and asked this question. What do you do to nourish your faith and keep the spirit alive? Pray and particularly read, study. I find it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, the more I read about, the more I learn, the more questions I have. And so it just fosters more reading. And that's the way I do it. Through activity in the church, like I say, especially with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and things like that. Prayer groups, guitar groups, music groups, young people. During the day I talk to God when I'm riding in my car, when I'm at work, when I have a problem, I talk to Jesus. I try my best to meditate on how Christ would have done, uh, how he would have done in a certain situation, how he would have uh, treated that situation and how he would have performed throughout it. And I try to model my own life after that. It's quiet time by myself to reflect, basically. I wake up 5 o'clock in the morning, and I pray to St. Jude and St. Martin, and thank God that he let me see another day. Do the right thing, you know, try to, don't try to rip anybody off, or, you know, just try to be fair and just. It's the uh, aspect of living it, as opposed to, uh, you know, it, it's fine to clasp your hands and pray and all that, but when you get right down to it, living the, the faith in terms of being Christian and giving a good example and, uh, you know, taking care of things the way they ought to be taken care of. I it gives me great pleasure to meet you here. It has a deep meaning for me. It means you, the living child of God, here and now, alive in faith, united in the love of Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the lesson we learn from the life on, of St. John Neumann. What really matters in life is that we are loved by Christ and that we love him in return. In comparison, the love of Jesus, everything else is second. And without the love of Jesus, everything else is useless. And, and so, from this cathedral, I offer my greetings to the whole city of Philadelphia, the civil authorities, and all the people. As the city of brotherly love, as the first capital of the United States of America, you are a symbol of freedom and fraternal relations. My greeting is also a prayer. May the common dedication and the united efforts of all you citizens, Catholics, Protestants and Jews alike, 
succeed in making your inner city and suburbs places where people are no strangers to each other, where every man, woman, child feel respected, where nobody feels abandoned, rejected, or alone. I extend my blessing to all of you, those present here today, to your dear ones at home, to the aged and the sick, and in very special way, to all the young people and the children. God bless me, Philadelphia. When Pope John Paul II came to the United States two years ago, he stopped mainly at the large metropolitan areas. The one exception was Des Moines, Iowa. And it was on the strength of a touching invitation to the pontiff by farmer Joe Hayes that the Holy Father included Iowa on his schedule. The letter begins and then it's dated 19 July 1979. To His Holiness Pope John Paul II, we here at St. Mary's, Iowa, were delighted to hear of your reported visit to the Midwest. Possibly one of the most young and enthusiastic groups of representatives in the Church of America today is our own rural life people. Our prayer here in the heartland of our United States is that more people become aware of our program, develop a true concern for our land and its use by mankind. In this way, we can be a stepping stone in the proper use of our land for the betterment of mankind. Also, it is our request and desire to share the company with one of, if not the most humane popes of the church, Pope John Paul II. In the event that you are to be in the area, as reported in October this year, we would very much appreciate an audience with you. Please give firm consideration to our plea and pray for us in our cause. Yours in hopes and prayers, Joseph A. Hayes. It is October 4th, and on this feast of St. Francis in 1979, Pope John Paul II celebrated Mass for 350,000 people in Des Moines, Iowa, the heartland of America. brothers and sisters in Christ. The land is God's gift entrusted to people from the very beginning. It is God's gift given by a loving creator as a means of sustaining the life which he had created. Even now, after all this time, it's hard to believe that just one letter from a farmer in Iowa could trigger such a national event. Joe Hayes, farmer and family man, tells why he wrote it. Well, I wanted him to see the beauty. That's, you know, and he said it time and time again, the beauty. Uh, God has, has provided us with, with dynamic daily attractions 
Uh, you can talk about all your headline movies that come up out of Hollywood and everything else, but every day of, the, of my life, if, if I so desire, and I do every day, I appreciate something, just some little thing or another. It might be the water in the creek, it might be the crop growing, it might be a, a beautiful sunset, which we get a lot of here. It might be the wind blowing like it is today. Joe's love for the land and all living things were the reason for his heartfelt invitation to the Pope. But since protocol dictates that invitations to Rome originate from the local bishop, the next step was up to Des Moines Bishop Morris J. Dingman. I was convinced that, uh, that, that this was a, uh, a voice that had to be listened to and had to be followed through. And for anyone who thinks the timing of Joe's letter and the Pope's visit to Iowa were coincidence, just listen to this. He would never have come except for the letter, and I would never have invited him except for the, uh, for the letter. Uh, uh, Joe Hayes was an instrument of the Holy Spirit. No question. <laughs> Once the media got wind of the Pope's planned visit to Des Moines, life on the Hayes farm was never quite the same. It wasn't unusual for the family to find news reporters camped out on their doorstep. 13-year-old Rhonda Hayes remembers what it was like. Some of the kids would ask me, hey, was that your dad on TV last night? And then I'd say, yeah. I, I thought that was neat, you know. That, that was a neat thing for me to feel that their, their interest was there in a, a farmer. Look at that. We've got a farmer out here that's, that's sent a letter to the Holy Father. And, uh, and yet, it never affected my sincerity, you know, in sending the letter. He was uh, a media delight because uh, he comes through as a, a, as a real farmer. Uh, he speaks from his heart, and that's why they loved him. The media blitz was only one part of the excitement Actually, some might call it panic. Not only did the Diocese of Des Moines have less than five weeks to prepare for the Holy Father's visit, communications director, Sister Myra Mosley, had been at her new job for only three and a half weeks. I guess that if I'd known that ahead of time, if it was in the job description that that would be the first project, I probably would have been so scared I never would have taken the job. But all of a sudden, there it was. There were a lot of us who were new on the staff, Gradually, we came to realize that we had a lot of decisions, and we made them one by one. Deadlines were every day, and it all worked out. It was really the work of the Spirit. The Spirit worked in other ways, too. When the dream of the Pope's proposed visit became a reality, all systems were go. Bishop Dingman's home became command central for the team of organizers, while local craftsmen were busy making everything from the altar structure to the chalice and plate for the consecration. People came from everywhere, from other dioceses, from other faiths, and gave of themselves freely. What I think sticks in my mind the most is, is the sharing that we had with all the people that was involved, and the, the continual thought of it and being a good, wholesome, uh, occasion to, to have done something really neat. Something's going to last the rest of my life, no doubt. John Paul II celebrated Mass on the site of the Living History Farms, a 600-acre replica of farm life going back to the 1840s. The Interfaith Church of the Land is now being built there in commemoration of the Pope's visit. Joe Hayes enjoys going back and reliving the day whenever he gets the chance. I can look across these fields and these pastures and and I can see people. I can still see people sauntering in from over across the highway. I can see people piling up on the back of the ridges where they can get an opportune view. If you look out across here, you could probably tell where the people would have stood and, and sat and laid and everything else waiting about the, the uh, coming of the Pope. It all makes me kind of excited. I, I get a little up about it anytime I talk about it. excitement mounts and mounts and mounts and so you, you know you're, you're almost shaking you know you know everything's gonna happen and, and here he comes you know to all of you who are farmers I want to say this the church highly esteems your work few Midwesterners will ever forget the Pope's visit to the heartland of America but even to people around the country, the name Joe Hayes is synonymous with that special day. It comes down and the, and, the, and the bishop says, 
pardon me, Your Holiness, he says, this is the man who wrote you the letter to come to the heartland. And the Pope stops where he is, and he stops, and he takes me by the hand, and he pulls me in close, and he says, the farmer, he says, the farmer, we are all farmers. The Mass is ended. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. I felt real nice and real elated about the fact that, yes, he did. He came when we invited him, and he enjoyed it, and he loved it. He thought the beauty was awe-inspiring, and I'm sure it was to him, and, it's, and it will be any time that he comes over. I hope that he comes back. Although Iowa is noted for its cornfields, Joe Hayes obviously felt that the state was worthy of a visit of the Holy Father. It was another sign of God reaching out to all his people. Next week we'll find out about the permanent diaconate program in the Trenton Diocese and learn of a unique Catholic lobbying group. Our short segment will feature Father Joe Champlin on grandparents and entertainment from company. We would like to hear from you about how you like Real to Real. Why don't you write us? Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Philadelphia 19103. Thanks for being with us. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye and God bless you.